I sort of wanted to start today uh, with something that has been a project on my mind. And, um, and uh, just sort of put it out there and get the conversation rolling here. Um, I'm sure most of you, here, let me get this in the screen here, recognize the River Rossi, you know, effectively OO scale product, okay? The, this is the standard Genoa. And um, one of my things that I started to look at when I got into this, um, Abdel's book, as I got my first perusing of it, I decided to count off the uh, photos today of straight back boilers versus, and I forgot the exact technical name of this bowl, bowl, boiler, excuse me. Um, look it up in White's book and couldn't find it. But I was like, how many of these versus the Mason straight back? Okay. And I found 26 photos that I could confirm of the straight back. Uh, and about 43 of that, whatever you want to call it, humpback, uh, Thomas Rogers, uh, like in front of White's book here, that hump, okay? And, um, and came to the conclusion after doing a little bit of math, it, it's like, 27 26% of the pictures are straight backs. Uh, the other, whatever, 75 or so, 74 are the humpback. So I definitely wanted to get a couple of the straight backs uh, into my fleet as I begin this process. And I, of course, very much favor the Mason product, which spans anywhere from, you know, the hop and the Winton to locomotives in uh, the B and O, uh, and any and even uh, the B and O one eight eight was a Mason that Jackson seized in. Uh, Western Virginia during the great train raid. So I definitely wanted some of those in my fleet. And I, I was just sort of wondering how other people feel about that uh, in their collections. Good morning, George. Howdy, fellas. So my, let me put that out there. Walter, what do you think? Um. I don't know, that kind of thing always makes me wonder why. Like I remember seeing on the front of engines that sometimes they have this box because when going up a steep grade, the water would go back. And so they had to you know, get water in the front of the boiler so it wouldn't you know, have too much temperature difference. And so when there's a difference like that, what is it manufactured? Was one of later design, you could, you could fit more in, you could have a bigger boiler and have more power there for. Or what, what was the reasoning behind when the difference? The, Go the ahead, Dave. What, what you're calling the humpback is what's called a wagon top boiler as opposed to a straight boiler. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the wagon top was to provide more space for steam to be pure steam and not water splashing up. Uh, it's the same sort of thing as the very, very early uh, sort of dome tops in the back that are called the Burry boiler, because that provides more space for the steam. Where above the firebox, where there's, there could be some splashing essentially going on. Uh, some of the early locomotives had three domes. Do you remember those pictures of those mm -hmm. things? 
and there was a big dome in the front of the look. Yeah, there you go. And mm -hmm. so the the dome that's up by the smokestack there, that dome is a steam dome. And the purpose of that dome is to provide an area for steam to collect that's well above the water level so that the steam will not have any water in it. That way the throttle is up there in that first dome and the steam would be taken dry, essentially dry steam, no water in it going down to the cylinders. Because if you have water in the cylinders and the cylinders are going back and forth and the water doesn't compress, you can oh. crack a cylinder head. That's actually the purpose of the cylinder cocks actually is to blow out any of that condensed water. Or if you did sick, suck water into the dry pipe, it'll blow it out the, the cylinder cocks before you blow the cylinder head off. Yep, that's right. Hmm. So Mason and his locomotives had straight boilers there. And what made was there, it, were they called something, David? Say what? W were the straight ball uh, boilers called something specific? Like Not you said, wagon top? Other, other than just straight boiler. It was straight. Okay. I, I don't, don't know any other term for it. But the mason would put a steam collecting pipe, a big long steam collecting pipe that went almost the length of the boiler to collect steam from all over in the boiler and that way not collecting steam from just one area so you're less likely to pick up water that way yeah. interesting think think of it this way if you've got hot water here and it's under pressure in the boiler and then if you have a collection pipe right above the boiler level here and you pull open the throttle you're creating a, a vacuum essentially right there, just a tiny bit of a vacuum, but that's going to cause an eruption of, of water underneath as the pressure lowers and that water suddenly boils. So that's the reason you want the collection pipe either really high, the throttle really high above the water, or spread it out over a long distance. Interesting. No, and of course it looks Oh, I'm so, it, it looks beautiful, you know, the, that nice oh, straight yes. tubing down, you know, that's yeah. I love that appealed to me boilers. immediately. I love the straight boilers. Baldwin started using straight boilers in the uh, about the 1870s. So if you look at some Baldwin catalogs, then you'll see straight boiler locomotives there. Frequently with that third dome up near the stack. Okay. I saw once uh, there's there's an animation on the internet somewhere. It's like how a steam engine works. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I hadn't realized is when I was first learning stuff and they had a bunch of pipes all over inside the engine. And so the hot box actually had the hot air going all the way through even what we call the boiler. And it's just pipes in there. I always used to think it was just it was full of water as much as whatever. And it was just straight water, not pipes in it. Which is, are they both, am I both right? Or one's mm -hmm. the later evolute or what's? I think what you're talking about are the flues. So you have the boiler, which will be filled with water. And then on the on the back of the firebox, they have the, the, the sheet with the all the holes, the holes in it. The and that's where all the hot air will flow. And then underneath the stack, you have what's called the uh, the blower. Sorry, momentary lapse of cerebral activity. I've been, uh, I've been awake for 10 minutes. Um, well, in all fairness, I was up till two 30 last night, decaling a tender. Um, okay. but anyway, underneath the stack, you have a blower and the blower is pressurized ring of steam that shoots steam out the stack for the exact reason, like David was talking about to create a vacuum. And what that does, it draws the hot air out of the firebox through the flues, which is going through the water and the water then is getting all that hot air around it to heat up and boil and create the steam and that blower draws the the, the air out of the stack out of the stack and so it draws it out of the firebox through and up and then inside those flues then is where the hot air would flow through but then you have the water all around it um inside the 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 cab you have a sight glass a water sight glass and it's an oval shaped piece and it kind of waters with, uh, goes with the water line. So the firemen can watch the water levels inside there to make sure that the top of the firebox, the crown sheet is covered um, because if that's not covered, 
then you can run into problems with the crown sheet getting too hot and exploding. Okay. And now, where would that be local? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to simply ask, where would that um, water gauge, water level gauge, be located in the cab? Um, usually on the fireman's side. Let me pull up this. Hold on. I'll pull up my cab interior picture because right now the engine's upstairs and before I. Um, so I don't know how well you can see that, but the water sight yeah. gauge is right here. Oh, OK. So the golden, the, the part I painted brass was more so you can see it is where the. Um, where the water sight glass is. So it's below the top of the boiler, but down below. So the fireman can actually watch that water level and make sure. So when he's going uphill, downhill or whatever, he can watch that water level and make sure it stays below or stays where it's supposed to be to make sure that crown sheet's covered. Okay. Would, would a grade upset going up or down a grade upset the water level to the effect where you're produ producing less steam or something of that nature? Um, not necessarily because they're watching it. And then remember, you're also not going up a 7% grade. Okay. So it'll, it'll affect it a little bit. And that's why they watch it. And so usually what will happen is as they're approaching the grade, the fireman will know what the grade is and will know, okay, I need to put a little bit more water into the boiler now. Um, now, granted, more of that is more with like the modern locomotives that I'm talking about with injectors and, wa and feed water systems and stuff like that. These were mechanical driven water pumps off the crosshead. So I don't know. I don't know. I know I noticed on some of the drawings, there's like a cable coming from the cab down to the water pump. So I'm assuming that's where he would allow him to open and close the water pump. So if they were full water they wouldn't they would close that off that's what i'm assuming that's for that uh that cable you're talking about was actually a solid rod okay it was attached it was attached to a screw valve in the oh okay pump. oh got it okay because yeah. i'm going to try to have that on my rod yeah there was a wheel that the, you could turn in the cab and it would twist that rod and that would close and open the valve i believe that's the way it worked Okay. It's possibly could have, could have been a push pull with a lever valve, but I think it's a screw. That I, actually I, makes that actually makes sense what you're saying, David. And and in like today's, they have a lever and kind of an open valve, so they actually have a rod inside there that they pull and pull or pull and push. But it also depends on the type of injector too. You you're talking about that. Uh, blower thing in the smoke box to create a draft through the fire there. Mm -hmm. And back in the uh, in the early days, there was no mechanical fan kind of blower. It was just a, an exhaust pipe that pointed straight up with a constriction at the end of the exhaust pipe to make a jet of steam. Mm -hmm. And that's attached to the exhaust of the cylinder. So the cylinder exhaust would come up through that jet and there are articles about kind of the sound of these things, but that's what causes that choo, 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 choo kind of sound as the locomotive puffs along as those jets of steam coming out. Mm. And some of the early, mm -hmm. before people recognized how the draft was controlled, there are actually some really early 1840s kind of locomotives that would regulate the power of that blast by simply putting a, a tapered cone down in the in the uh, open area to mm. constrict the blast or allow more so they could vary the amount of uh, air that was going through the firebox. Very, very strange stuff on early locomotives. And you were talking about the sight glass thing for the fireman to see where the water was. That's a relatively recent invention in steam locomotives. I don't think those things were out in steam locomotives until the, at least the 1870s or 1880s. Back in the Civil War, there was no sight glass, but you had three little valves sitting on the back head there. And you could open the valve, just, just like opening the uh, water valve for your hose outside in the house. But you could mm -hmm. open the valve, and if water came out, then the water level was at least at that height. So the three valves were at, at an angle at different heights above the okay. water. 
So you open the bottom valve, water should come out, crown sheet's covered. Open the top valve and steam should come out with no water on the top valve. And that's okay too, because then you're not putting water into the throttle. Open the middle valve and you should get a little bit of water plus a little bit of steam and that's ideal. Hmm, okay. so the fireman had to sit there and monkey around with the water valves to determine where the water was in the boiler. So the sight glass was pretty convenient when that thing was finally invented. Huh. Well, I, I admit that I put that on there because um, I think we were talking about this one of the times that I was the cab interior I was modeling after was after uh, was in Buster Keaton's The General. And because it was very simplified at that point, and that's the oldest video or photographic record of a cab interior that I've seen. Um, Cause like, if you even go and look at the current general, there's so many valves and knobs and stuff, but most of that's oil fire stuff. Um, and so that's what I used for this. But, you know, so in my world, my engineer was way ahead of his time because of the sight glass. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm not judging it now. But he was still using a mechanical pump and not an injector, right? Uh, yeah, I do have that. Let me see if I can find a, a good side picture of where it's at right now. Um, I just put another coat of uh, um, Microsol or Solvacet or whatever on the decals to try to get them to sit. The two of them Welcome, Andrew. You made it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. No, no, no. The, the, uh, the, the three valves in the cab, uh, how did they handle um, like a, a camelback? Uh, did the, was it just for the engineer or did the fireman have one too? Uh, the sight glass are you talking about? The, the, the sight glass or the, those three valves. Those, the three those valves have. were on the back end and in a camelback the fireman would be the only one who could see them. Oh. There's your crosshead pump. Mm -hmm. So I just got all this installed this week. And so the next step is to get the feed water pipes underneath and behind the drivers to the back to the tender. So that's going to get installed later this week. So on the back of the water pump, I'll get those installed and run those pipes, but that's the one. These are the the ones I bought off of Shapeways. Um, they're they're a little more painted now too. By the way, I painted the uh, on the check valve up top. I painted the sides the the rush iron blue and the top red. But this is how it right. existed two weeks ago. Very nice. How did you get those uh, hexagonal? Uh, dome bases. Uh, what did you do to construct that? Um, those are uh, cow scale domes. They are? So the, these two are cow scale domes, yes. And they already came with the Rogers hexagonal, hexagonal dome bases. The one that's okay. not, the one that's yeah, I've not. I've got a few of those. I didn't know they had that. Yeah, this one is the factory Bachman one. Um, I used it because the shape was right, but I had to go down and file the base of that a little bit to make it look more hexagonal. So I masked And that's off all you did? Yeah, that's all I did. I masked okay, off the, the right. boiler and then just sat there with a file until it looked close enough. And it's only hexagonal on three sides. If you look really closely at the top of the boiler, it's rounded. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it still gives a, a, a wonderful side view effect. So what the hell? Yeah, exactly. That was what I was going for. But this is the whole overall before the ankle rails were built. That's what it was looking like. I've repainted the sand dome. That's black now. And then the ankle rails are actually done. But this was the mock-up two weeks ago. And then... Since I got your pilot and I have yours, I'm going to ship it out Monday. Oh, okay, replace, great. Thank you. Replace yours. Because um, they showed up uh, Thursday afternoon. This so Thursday, see. though, right? Yeah. 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 Let's see. So 
So here's after the pilot installation. I cut off the bottom rung and then cut off underneath the, the cross beam. Well, if you don't mind me asking, why did you cut off the bottom rung? Um, mostly for space reasons, because the clearance, in my opinion, was too close to the rail. Oh, okay. Or would have been too close to the rail, because, I mean, you, that's sitting it there, and you can see how close it is, because that's not actually glued in place yet, because the painting is not finished. Um, so I was mocking it up, but what reason I did that was because when I did mock it up against the pilot, I felt like the bottom rung of the pilot was going to rub on the track. Mm. So I was like, well, I'm just going to cut it off. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. I was just kind of wondering because I, the, I'm, I'm noticing that the bar at the top mm -hmm. uh, is not aligned with the top of the, um, what are they called? Uh, the, the front extension the from crossbeam? the boiler. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Okay, it, that that was not flush with the top of that. Well, here's it installed, and so you can kind of see how close it is already to the table, and that's not on rails. That's with the flanges. Wow. Okay, that is very very close. So that's okay. why I cut I, the bottom rung. Okay. Off. And then here's a better view. You can see where I cut the sides off too, because those those bars extended behind that cross beam. Yes. And so and I just cut was, it flush. That was a wise choice because I noticed that problem as well in trying to make the uh, the Texas or the general. Right. So that's okay. it installed as it stands right now. And you, so like I said, you can see how close it was. So I just cut off the bottom rung. Plus that next rung was a little more pointed, kind of something you pointed out um, that that yeah. pilot was more rounded on the nose. So I yeah, I was wondering if you could just sand that a little more, whatever, straighter. Yeah, no. Yeah, I thought so too. And but this is ultimately what I did because when I mocked it up and set it up there, I thought, man, that's awful close. That's going to cause problems because I know I travel a lot and I'm planning to run this thing. And um, so when I go to different layouts, all it takes is one odd rail to be like this, and it'll catch it every time. Yeah. Um, oh, Good here's point. here's here's as the here's the boil the the domes as they sit right now. Mm. Excellent. Then, now, uh, let me ask you something. Did you replace the drive? Did you use different driver rims, or did yes. you? Um, use the original about the fenders. Was I'm sorry, say again, George. The fenders? Yes. Those are the original? No. Often? The, these are the ones I bought on Shapeways also. Oh, okay, okay. They're a little thicker. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The shapeways parts that you're using are are you um, are they plastic or did you have them made in uh, brass? No, I had, didn't have. I don't think brass was an option. If I and if it was, I didn't pay attention to it. But the um, uh, the they're the, the fine plastic or something. All right, so here's the mock-up of the whole locomotive as it sits right now, trying to weigh it out. Mm. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of it because I added almost an entire weight, uh, almost an entire ounce. So that's 4.2. I originally measured 3.3 ounces on the locomotive. Mm. Now, George, as I remember, uh, you put up the lower half of the locomotive um, in our last Saturday meet. 
I saw in the new Bachman, since you have the new Bachman, mm -hmm. weights to either side, or did I see weights to the, oh, thank you. Yeah, the weights above the drivers, which mm -hmm. of course is not what's in the old uh, tender uh, Correct. driven Bachman's. Right. Um, now, I'm just kind of wondering, do they, um, I guess they're more form-fitted form for the um, wagon top boiler? These are very form-fitted. Um, you know, I'm looking at this design of this model now because uh, putting weight in it was one of my goals. And um, you remember, um, I think all of you guys, except Andrew, were in the, the meeting when Don did his uh, upgrade video where he talked about upgrading locomotives changing the motor changing the one of the things he said and it's stuck it's stuck in the back of my mind for some reason i don't know why now i do was you have to balance because these locomotives you have to put weight in certain areas or it'll be forward heavy and uh so what happened was i got all the way done with this and i'm looking at this um you know, I'm looking at this front space and now there's nothing there. So I was like, cram it full of weight, you know, pound, you know, I could put, you know, four or five ounces of weight right there alone because that whole boiler's empty. Well, what happened was when I actually put the mock-up and did the, when I did this mock-up here, locomotive got front heavy. And so it would lean forward a little bit on the front two pilot trucks and there's no springs or anything to push it back. Mm -hmm. And so it was, so what happened was it would lean forward on those drive. And so the rear driver would lift off the ground. I went, ah, come on, dang it. So I didn't put any weight. So the boiler's still empty and I had to cram weight in there. And so let me see if I've got, so there's a little bit of weight in the, uh, cap over the dry under the drivers but to put some weight in this thing there's a little bit of moldable weight around where the circuit board plugs in or wires into place because there was some empty space there and the next one is the weight that i the molded weight that i put inside the cab to try to help balance Included it out a little bit. Top. Yep. Good and it's plan. now painted. It's now Would painted. Have never thought of that. It's now painted the same color as the interior of the cab. <laughs> so Good you'll job. never see it. But I did run into a minor issue though. And um, you might be able to see it here in this picture. You see those guys? Those are the guys, Roger, you told me to get? Yes. And I got them. And none of them were sitting. They were all in a mostly standing position. Mm. And so the guy there that you see with his arm out on the, on the uh, window, I bent, 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 and I couldn't get him to bend enough. So I said, well, they're going to break. So I just cut them off. And then I molded legs out of that moldable lead. And then yeah. I sat them down. Well, the only way he would have fit even with that, you know, without the weight inside the top of the cab is if I put those legs at his chest. Um, so he was just a little tall. Um, so I've actually got, I found some different figures I'm going to try now and get them on the way. So they're on the way. They're supposed to be here Tuesday. I may swap heads. I haven't decided yet. But the point was, was like, I was like, oh, come on. You're just, a, but in an effort to try to make them fit, I molded legs out of the moldable lead and glued it on to try to give at least an illusion that he had legs. So, I mean, once it's inside the cab and once it's in front of that side of the boiler, hell, you ain't gonna be able to see that. Yeah. So, and I, you can see the guy behind him. I tried to do the same thing and both of them, their head would have had to have a, a hole in the top of the roof for their heads to fit. And I went, ah, well, <laughs> I'll use them for something else. There'll probably be passengers inside the cars, but, um, but the, so the reason they're on there was because I was trying to give me an overall weight with the metal figures too. Right. Did you, what, what figures did you pick? Uh, oh, by the way, good morning, Tomo. Uh, what figures did you end up picking, George? 
Um, I've got ones from uh, Old Campbell. Old Campbell. Campbell. Campbell scale models. Um, here, I'll find it. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, Weston Campbell. Come on. I'm just trying to get to a picture of it. So there's my engineer. Okay. So he looks a little shorter than the other ones and he's in a sitting position. So hopefully that'll, that'll work. And he's even got a mustache. There you go. <laughs> splice off the, uh, splice off the boiler. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the, well, yeah, the bowler, yeah, the, bowler. Has, bowler. the other one. You're in business. You got that bowler you go. as you uh, originally proposed. So, but there's the last, there's the last one of the pictures I've got of the front. We were, I was testing the lights because I've got firebox light and headlight because I rewired that six pin circuit board. I used what's called half wave wiring and that's why it's on the rail is it uses track power to ground the lights. And so what I did is I used the wire, touched one side of it to the, te to my LED tester and then the other one to the rail just to make sure everything worked and it did so. Excellent. So it'll be fun. I'm, I'm pretty excited. I'm, I'm hoping it'll be done next week. Um, I have a show in Cheyenne in two weeks, so I'm hoping to take it there and uh, be able to show it off and run it. You know, you're, you're thinking about the, in the front, that steam thing made me think of uh, around the 1840s in England, there was this uh, Brunel, I believe is the name, he wanted to have a seven foot railway because since railways were first getting started, uh, Stevenson and so on using it for coal, it's just they're making it, making uh, locomotives out of their garage, basically. And so they just, what do we have to make it with? They use the carriage stuff. So that's why we have the same as the carriage with. Ruben L said, no, this is a whole new technology. We got to you know think it from the ground up. And he thought if he had seven foot wide, you have more stability, you can use more power. It, it, it's a whole different kind of thing. And so then the, uh, so there was a big fight then who is going to be the seven foot or going to be the, you know, the, the, what we have now for standard gauge. And he was sure it could make a better engine. He made this big steam engine that would go on a seven foot wide rail or, you know, gauge, well, say seven feet wide on the rails. And when they went and tested it, they had all sorts of cool things to test. It was no more powerful and it pissed him off. And so he, he knew enough engineering. He literally started the intake and went through like, this should work, this should work, this should work. Finally, when he got to the end, what he found was the exhaust pipe was slightly constricted and the back pressure from having it so small was, was having him lose his power. So all he did is increase the diameter of the exhaust pipe and then he got it. That gave him the extra power like he thought it would have. But for a person to be that knowledgeable about engineering, to be able to go through every bit of it and, and track it down, nail it, I, I'm just impressed with that. So, the thing that always impressed me is they did that before computers. So they're doing this by hand and drawings. There are some reproductions of those uh, seven-foot gauge uh, engines at Didcot in uh, in Britain. They've made they've made at least one reproduction of one of the seven-foot gauge engines. It's impressive. Very large. Very big. <laughs> Full size, Andy? Full size. Full size. I, I think it's called Firefly, I think is the name of the one that they re, rebuilt. But then if you make a locomotive like that, you don't have any track to run it on. <laughs> well, yeah, unfortunately, too, when, when the government went to the survey, they found ab once he got that thing fixed with the exhaust, Everything, they would do a smoother ride. Uh, they could pull more stuff. Like all the stuff he said was true, but they had, I forget how many thousands of miles already with standard gauge. And they only had 200 miles, the seven foot gauge. So if the government's gonna do it, either we tear up 200 miles or we tear up a few thousand miles and just the expense it would take to rip up all the standard gauge. Uh, it was like, okay, skip it. We'll just do standard gauge anyway. So even though he proved he was right, they still didn't go with them. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, the Erie was was 
wide gauge here in the states. Um, eventually, they had to uh, standard gauge it, but but their their engines were all big <laughs> too for that. Well, heard generally in the south, the reason we're five foot is most of your freight traffic was cotton, which was very light. So it made sense to have five foot gauge in the South because uh, your car, the cargo is so light, you needed the space more than the weight bearing, so. Mm -hmm. Did they have wider cars, uh, Walter, as a, as a um, you know, yes. accompanying the wider track for sake so you can carry more cotton? I, I, I didn't read that, I, that is assumed. I assume that, but I don't know that. Okay. I always thought that the, the reason that there was a five foot gauge in the south and the four foot eight and a half gauge uh, in the north was because people didn't know exactly where to measure the gauge. And so if you got a five foot long stick and put that five foot long stick between the rail heads, you have a five foot gauge. But if you take that same five foot stick and put it center to center of uh, the railheads, it comes out four foot eight and a half. So it may just be that they didn't know where to measure the gauge. <laughs> mm. But the other thing is that when you had two railroads coming into the same town, frequently the gauges would be different just so that you could employ Teamsters to haul freight from one railroad to the other. And the railroads were essentially forbidden to interchange cars. If you look at the early um, trolley lines, a lot of the uh, interurban trolley lines were built to odd gauges just so they could not compete with the steam railroads for haul and freight. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of it, but that, you know, that one time early in the war when uh, a bunch of soldiers and it was Baltimore or something got attacked because they were going from one rail to the other rail because they did, they did not have a union station and it was go from one to the other. And because they do that travel, then the citizens protested and, and you know, caused trouble for the military. Well, I was, I was looking at um, years ago, uh, Bernie Kopinski made an HO gauge um, layout for Alexandria. And uh, he had a map in there of the, what was it? Two, I guess there's two railroads going into Alexandria. The, I forgot the full name of it, but it's like the New Hampshire, the one that headed directly due west to Leesburg. And then of course the Orange and Alexandria. And they were separated as the war began. And then the US uh, MRR wanted them connected. So they created the uh, connections in order to do that uh, through, you know, the city of Alexandria. Uh, and for, I mean, that made sense to me. Dave, you had something, please elaborate. Oh, you're right. You're right on that, Roger. And I don't recall what the gauges of both of those railroads were. I assume that they were the same gauge. Uh, but you're right. It was almost like an act of Congress to connect them together. <laughs> hmm. That actually brings up my a question I've had is how much would interchange traffic would you have back then? Like, you know, modeling almost, West. I'm yeah, sorry. Almost none. No interchange at all. So like even the Southern railroads, like the Georgia Railroad and Western Atlantic, for example, you wouldn't see cars or locomotives on each other's rails? I don't, not very often if you would. Uh, there was almost no interchange at all. Uh, in the Southern railroads in the Civil War time, we had a real problem with North Carolina sitting in the middle mm -hmm. because North Carolina railroads were all to four foot eight and a half gauge. Mm -hmm. And Virginia railroads and the Tennessee railroads were, and the South Carolina railroads were all five foot. So there could be no interchange going north through North Carolina. Okay. But did not, I read um, uh, what, what the uh, trains on the 
It's the it's the one about uh, Sharp, the Confederate uh, gentleman who took all the engines that um, Jackson captured and parceled them out. She had a um, a shop in North Carolina. So he would have had that problem heading into count, uh, North Carolina, coming off of Virginia, uh, coming off a Virginia railroad, uh, or did they make his section gauged with Virginia? Go ahead, David. It's not as much of a problem as you might think, because okay. if if you want to change a locomotive that's four foot eight and a half inches. Uh, wheelbase there to a five foot gauge, all you do is change the tires. And mm. so you put extra wide tires on the locomotive and now it can run on the other gauge. I have no earthly idea. That makes sense. Wasn't the uh, presidential car, the Lincoln funeral car, wasn't that with a very wide uh, tire so it could accommodate that or is that not true it, it's logical i don't know i just don't know mm -hmm. and back when interchange started there were actually cars that were made with wheels that could slip on the axle and so you could loosen them at four foot eight and a half and slide them a little wider apart so that they could run on a uh, five foot case mm -hmm. they weren't particularly successful because in in running you know the, the thing could work back and then you have a derailment so that was not a particularly good idea, but they existed. Dave, would, um, okay, for say the um, General and the Texas were both purchased from, what was it, Patterson, New Jersey area, mm -hmm. shipped down. Mm -hmm. They basically would specify the gauge to be made upon I order? I assume, yeah, I assume so. They would have had to have been shipped, perhaps on flat cars. And I a lot of those, know. a lot of those Patterson built uh, engines, uh, the the actual mills where they were building the engines were not on the railroad themselves. So they actually had to move them through the streets, and that was true up up into the twentieth century. Hmm. So perhaps they could have been shipped on wagons, but something like that. Hmm. Yeah, that, makes that, an interesting, that, that would make an interesting modeled back. scene. Sorry, go ahead, George. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that would make an interesting modeled scene. <laughs> yeah. A handful of horses pulling a locomotive through the town square. There's some great pictures That's... of it. I've seen them. Good idea. Are, were there any pictures from uh, Jackson, Jackson's heist of uh, any of the engines heading down the Shenandoah Valley uh, Pike Road or anything like that? There I've, are. I've seen lithograph of it. Okay. I mean, you know, a drawing. Right. But photographs. Hello. Hmm. For four, outside of Brady, I thought there were a couple in Northern, but I never even heard of a Southern photographer. Does anyone know of any Confederate photographers? Well, there had to be. Uh, specifically, I know um, Jackson and uh, his um, is a adjutant, David Hyde uh, kid or David Kidd, Henry, whatever it was, uh, took pictures in Winchester that are, you know, Winchester specific. I've seen the original of his adjutant at, at um, Jackson's 1861 headquarters there in Winchester. So there had to be a photographer, at least in Winchester, but were they going out and making pictures for the government? Wow. Well, you know, we all know that the Richmond records were burned, so who knows if there was some sort of photographic history 
there. Here's a, here's something you talk about photography. I was looking for because we've had extensive conversations with our with the the group about the coloring and looking at the old type of photography versus modern black and white. Does anybody know of an app or a software that's developed to convert specifically wet plate photography versus modern black and white? Not heard of it. Because I would imagine if we know what we're looking for or about, I mean, I realize it's hard to backdate the coloring, but if we could at least get an idea and not necessarily use it for historical accuracy, but if we know like those photographs that we saw um, with uh, what's his face, David, I think he was doing that presentation, what last Thursday, um, if there was something there that we could see, okay, here's what these colors are. Here's what they look like in black and white wet plate. How can we do a conversion that way? And that's why I was curious. I was searching, trying to find something, but everybody wants to do regular. And when you plug in some of the old uh, Civil War pictures, they turn out more of an orange gray because they don't know what to do with the colors. Well, part of it was, yeah, one presentation we had a little while back said there are specific chemicals. It depends on what you're using. And so everybody had the way they wanted to mix it. And who knows if they mix it that way on that for that photograph. So unless somebody was really standardizing what they did, you wouldn't even know what mix they used when they made their, did their mm. process. Fair enough. Back quick. Go ahead, Dave. Back when I first, um, one of my first jobs out of college, I was a chemistry major and I got a job in a paint factory and we made different kinds of paint. And so you had a recipe that you'd use and you'd mix a dry pigment, so much of this, so much of that, you stir it all up and then you had to disperse the pigment throughout the um, uh, vehicle, the, the oil that, that contained it. And the color changed dramatically, depending upon what size you ground the pigment down to. If the pigment was larger particle, it looked like one color. If it was a little finer particle, it looked a little different. And the little different was actually significantly different. Hmm. And so there was one man in the factory who would take a sample of paint that was being made, match it to a known sample, and he'd know, well, I add a little bit of this, or I add a little bit of that, and I can get to match the color. This guy was the highest paid guy in the factory because he was the only one who could get the color right. Hmm. Interesting. And I'm sure there couldn't have been any sort of standard uh, standardization during the Civil War from, you know, time period from, you know, like they painted seems to be a general consensus that the Winton was a green. Uh, well, hell, was it a dark green? Was it an apple green? Was it a light green? What was it? And the next green locomotive that rolled off the uh, line, what green was it? And was the cab matching the tender? Who knows? <laughs> One thing I, I've done to try to to somewhat bypass that, you can actually get milk paint still. And so this is the actual pig that they, they get like dried milk particles. So it's not totally the same, but still, literally it's, it's the pigments that they would use back in the day. So yeah, it's gonna be different in a sense, but the thing is it's within the range of this is the chemicals they use. This is the products they use to make the paint. And so I think, well, the variance will be the real variances they actually have if you actually, actually use the milk paint. Well, pigment uh, what, what, do you, well, yeah, pigment colors. Walter, back. do you paint it on wood? Yeah. Or uh, plastic, does it work on plastic, whatever? Not very well, actually not very well. It doesn't work very well on plastic. And metal, okay, I don't know if this would be a kind of paint you'd use on metal, especially if it's gonna get hot, but this would be for like house paint. And that's the original. What they, they model this from is from people that did house paint and interior things. So I don't know how accurate it would be for industrial use. Dave, you had something on your mind. Oh, yeah. Um, the 
color of paint that would have been used back then, even now, is based on the cost of the pigment and the availability of the pigment. And so pigments that are easy to get and cheap are the more likely colors to be used. And they would be uh, scrape up the clay dirt that uh, is that red clay you find in Georgia, mix that in, and then you have red, barn red paint, dirt cheap. Burn something and get black soot, it's dirt cheap. Get some chalk and grind it up and get some white that way. But when you start talking blue and when you start talking green, then you're getting more expensive pigments and less likely to use. Okay, there were some yellow clays that were still cheap. So this is why we see certain colors back in the old days. They were just easy to get. Well, I mean, the names of the colors are indicative of where they came from. Like yes. if you go to a paint store now, you can get uh, burnt umber, raw umber. Um, the name umber is from Umbria in Italy, which is where that that color of paint is originally from. Uh, same with burnt sienna, sienna, Italy, the dirt of sienna. Um, there is a, um, I live in New York City um, and work at a, a big mu museum. I, I make mounts, I don't, I, I'm not a, a conservator or a painter, but um, there's a, a, a store here in New York called Kremer Paint and they, mix paint powders um, and they will match historic colors. Um, they do a lot of research into, into the, the formula of the paint. Uh, modern paints are, are mixed with mostly plastic. So, so I mean, they're, they're going back to, to older formulas. So they, they, that might be an interesting uh, area to, to, to ask if, you're, if you have a specific formulate that you're trying to match um, because they they do work with museums and and conservation groups to find those colors formulas mm. one thing also though it's not paint uh my brother is in some other engineering stuff and he said you know for a, fuji a while back you know it used to be when, when we first had like doing your home film there's daytime film and then there's well, I mean, indoor and outdoor and they were different. And then they cracked how to do it. So you have one film that you don't have to have indoor and outdoor. Fuji tried to get into it and they could never do as good as Kodak because apparently in, in layering, looking at paint, I don't fully follow it all, but there's like, when you put a paint layer on, there's a certain amount of reflection. And remember the other day when they, they talked about, uh, when you photograph something, if there's lacquer and so on, the reflection makes it so you can't really see what's, what is painted. There'll be a little of that reflective ability between layers of paint and so on, and that will mess up trying to do color matching. Kodak was able to crack the formula of how to compensate for reflections in paint and take it out so they could do higher, they could do better color matching than Fuji could. And mm -hmm. Fuji never quite cracked how to do that, the, the reflection messing up your, your color. Start matching it. Sorry, I stepped out there. Um, do you, you know, uh, Dave, you were talking about um, certain pigments being more expensive. Would, uh, I'm thinking aesthetically, would that be a company choice per se? Do we have a superior product because we use a superior paint or something? Or um, how do you think that would go based upon what you have uh, come across? Are, are you asking me, would uh, paint companies provide a couple of samples, different samples based on cost? Is that what you're saying? No, no. Uh, actually, I'm. Uh, the question I'm asking would be, why would a locomotive company choose, per se, an expensive color, i.e., blue or green, um, as uh, an aesthetic choice for their locomotive? Would would it be a way of distinguishing a superior piece of machinery, or? Um, Something of that nature. What What do you think, based on what you've? Pure, 
pure speculation on my part. I would just suspect that that would be saying, oh, look how good my product is over the competition. Mm. But I don't know. I don't know one way or the other. Well, I guess what I'm bouncing off here is because of the Russian iron and its reflectiveness, uh, there is this idea that the, uh, like, let's say if blue was the on the cap and uh, tender, there would be this reflective blue in the Russian iron, hence giving a, a different um, hue to the iron itself. Uh, you know, you can almost paint a slightly greenish one you can, because you have a green cab. You can pay, paint a bluish one because you have a blue cab. Uh, I wonder what the red would do to it, yeah, or even the Indian, what was called the Indian red, so. Um. Russia iron, you remember, is is, is not a paint. Russia right. iron, right? It's it's a corrosion resistance is what you're looking for. It's an anti-rust kind of thing, and so the the color of the Russian iron depends upon the chemical composition of the iron itself. It, it's kind of like gun bluing, and and you to, the color you wind up with at the end depends upon the chemicals within the iron itself that you're starting with. So, so iron has a variation in colors from <clears throat> one batch of iron to another. It's a patina rather than a paint, is my understanding. Okay. So it would be like that. Yeah, and the, the corrosion resistant coating essentially would change color over time as okay. it's exposed to weathering. And iron would, is not always the same color. Say that again. Iron, I, I thought of iron as like an element, but it's true. I see rusty rails oh. look different. But no, oh. the, the iron is going to be an alloy. It's not going to be pure iron. It's going to have other things mixed in with it, other, other metals mixed in okay. with it. And they will affect the color of the Russian iron. Would one section uh, now, okay, now the Russian iron would be a coat of iron, correct? A, 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 a sheet, an outer sheet from the boiler, correct? Yes, Russia iron is a very, it's a very thin piece of, of metal that's put over the so-called lagging of the boiler, the insulation around the boiler itself to keep that insulation dry so it doesn't rot, essentially. But the Russian iron coating over it and try to keep the Russian iron from rusting, if you will, back before you had stainless steel. Okay. So in the different sections of the boiler divided by the brass straps, could there be different, whatever, shades or something to that effect of the Russian iron between them or would they all come from one sheet? You got me, I don't know. Yeah, just, just, just a thought. You know, it's, well, we've got this old one over here that's the same size as this boiler. Let's bring this one over here, put it in the middle, save some money. Well, you could, I guess. It, it could be used as justification if you didn't get the paint quite right on the locomotive model. <laughs> well, that's what I'm, if, if George could do it, I can too. Okay. <laughs> Whatever smoke... George does, we all can do. By God, you know. The smoke box on the front of the that. engine was that usually graphite in in uh, Civil War era, graphite coated. The smoke box, no. Oh, so I, I got to go. I got an appointment. So it's been a great meeting. See you all next week or Thursday. See you, Walter. All right, Walter. We'll see you. Okay, Walter. Okay. I would assume there would be some sort of graphite because it would be, it'd have to be heat resistant because, I mean, that's the same thing I was looking at when I was building this one is what, you know, dark black or something like that, because you'd have to have some sort of heat resistant paint or coating 
at least since it's directly by the firebox. And in this case of the uh, smoke box, you've got the, the heat coming right. Whoops. Yeah, that's not good. Looks like we lost him for a moment. Yeah, he dropped out a minute ago and came back, but yeah. maybe not this time. So I would have a question. Why, why would anyone want to paint the firebox or the smoke box? Why would, why would you want to put a coating on that? When I can understand Russia iron trying to preserve that metal from rusting, it's thin metal. But what about the smoke box? Do we need to worry about what the smoke box looks like? Will the heat from the fire continually keep that thing from rusting? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Or did they like, um, or did they blacken it like armor armorers did during the medieval times as a means of? You know, well, hell, it's it's going to be in the hot place, so let's blacken it right away. And uh, that protect that was also a preservative. It was the reason why they did it. Hmm. I wonder. All right, my internet's terrible. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> but what I was saying was the flocal graphite color, which is what I used here on the stack in the smoke box, was basically a black with some occasional glitter flakes in it. Hmm. It was interesting, but I liked the I like the way the color looks. It's just it was tough to paint on a couple of times because it would get those flakes would get stuck in the airbrush, and I'd have to go clean it and then shoot it again. Hmm. The only reason I come up with that conclusion was because after I looked at the finished thing, I see an occasional sparkle and I was looked at it a little closer and went, huh? Well, that's not one to use in the airbrush again. <laughs> well, graphite is black. And so if you mix it with some kind of oil and smear it on the smoke box, then the smoke box is going to be black, basically. Same mm -hmm. thing about the firebox. You smear that oil with the black powder on it, soot essentially on it, it's going to be predominantly black. The, uh, the graphite that you have in a pencil lead today is not really mm -hmm. graphite. That's no. not good. Could it have been flat or a satin or would it be shiny? Probably flat. Probably flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it had enough oil in it, I guess it could be set. It's all I know, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take your poison and go for it. Well, what was good. one of the early conversations we had? It's like, well, there's not a whole lot of hard, tangible evidence to prove one thing or the other, so go for it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. As long as you can justify what you did to somebody else and the other guy doesn't know more than you do. You <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. Until you build the time travel machine. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, like I, I was remembering, I went to the B&O Museum a couple of years back, uh, looking at a course number 25. And um, I was, you know, oh my God, this is, dark you know the the, the russian eye, this is dark and uh dc goes yeah you didn't see it in the sunlight did you i'm like uh, duh and uh you know so once again pick your poison you know because some guys want it dark and some guys want it bright uh i must have met a kind of favor the bright uh i i'm thinking of once i finally make the decision, I might put a little tint of blue if I do a, like a hop, or put a little tint of green if I do a uh, Winton, and uh, or even the, even a little tint of red for an Indian red, you know, and kind of make it bright that way and see what happens. And if I don't like it, change it, just like George, you know, he's probably got five, 
five layers of paint on there now, uh, but he's happy, you know. Seems like the bottom line on color is choose a color that's plausible and the color that you like. It's good enough. All right. And it gives you the aesthetic you, uh, the aesthetic you want again with everybody else. And the other thing I, um, I often find annoying when we're having these meetings is you're not getting because of whatever tinting you have on the screen, you're not getting the true color coming across. Uh, so you can't really get a, a good gauge on what, you know, he's done. Cause I know when uh, George first showed, uh, his general, it looked like it was super dark. And then he got, he, he gave me an over a uh, light over it picture and it was, Oh, okay. Here's that blue he's talking about. Uh, made sense. Right. Hmm. Well, this is the uh, Vallejo gunmetal blue color that I picked. And I really kind of like it. I don't know how dark or light it is in real comparison, but I like the way it looks. Mm -hmm. So. Very nice. That's my justification. Yep. I mean, I always thought, I mean, we did a Rush Iron uh, 280 with our Blackstone stuff. And I kind of said, I always thought it was a little too light myself, but. That's what, you know, our project managers and everybody picked. And it's like, okay. And I, and just like David was saying, I know there's some variations in it. So I went with this and I thought I liked it. And it gives that little metallic look to it also. No, it looks beautiful. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I like it, George. Stay with it. Yeah, there we go. Very nice. But, Thanks, guys. Guys, I'm going to need to go sometime soon, too. Well, gentlemen, it, it is, you know, we've been here an hour. Uh, do we want to continue or is everybody good? We'll move on. What do you say? I think we're good. Yeah, I was just saying, I think I'm going to take the wife to have breakfast. My internet's crashing. I need to have something good. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday if I if I can make it indeed. So all right. So y'all have a good weekend. And Roger, this will get in the mail on Monday. Roger, thank thanks you for hosting. You did a good yeah, job. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Certainly. We're supposed yeah. to give you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll give Tom hell for that. Right. One, okay? Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs> all right. Bye -bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care, guys. Bye, Bye, Bye now. Thanks for doing this, Roger. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.